So I'll present or introduce each one in turn. The first presenter is Donna Lee Rosen, and the title of her presentation is Mapping Motivations for a Canadian Ledger Relationship. Thanks. Good afternoon. So I'm Donna Lee Rosen, and I'm here to present to you Mapping Motivations for a Canadian Leisure Relationship. What is the tourist perception of Canada as a leisure destination prior to their arrival to Canada? Did the Canadian leisure journey meet their expectations? What is it about Canada that tourists associate to a positive experience? Why is this important to study? Global international tourism has increased steadily over the past few years. However, the Canadian market share has fallen from 7th to 18th place. The Canadian Tourism Commission, in the meantime, has won awards for their marketing strategies. And the federal government has decreased its tourism budget by over 41% in the same period of time. Look at all the economic stakeholders. Now, this isn't all. I couldn't put them all on here. Tourism revenue generated more than $78 billion into the Canadian economy in 2012. That's greater than lumber and fishing combined. <coughs> Increasing tourism by 5% would increase almost $4 billion in incremental trade activity. David Goldstein, president of the Tourism Industry Association of Canada, spoke in as recent as March 13, 2014. How do we increase tourism and tourism revenue? <coughs> into Canada. The um, Canadian Federal Tourism Strategy focuses on four priorities. Number one, increasing awareness of Canada as a premier tourist destination. This research will touch on that. Number two, I'm going to leave for somebody else. Uh, number three, encouraging product development and investments in Canadian tourism assets and products. And we hope our outcomes will touch on that as well. And kudos for all those teaching in the School of Hospitality and Tourism Management. We're already fostering an adequate supply, or trying to foster an adequate supply of skills and labor um, in our tourism industry. Distinguishing between brand and image has been studied extensively. The actual perception is culturally unique and therefore needing to be evaluated with each generation. There is a need to assess the current perceptions in relation to the message intended. There is a need to assess this current generation. Bernard, close your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> what is the first image that pops into your head when you think about Canada? First image, first image. Don't think about it too much. <laughs> Look at that. Could that be an image? What are we looking for? And I think Stacy's doing this. <laughs> the purpose of my research is to understand the perception of Canada by Australians prior to their Canadian leisure journey. Capture the positive experience as indicated by Australian travelers. The outcome will help us gauge the satisfaction of these leisure tourists identifying any gaps and focus on encouraging areas of strength. Understanding the perceptions and interests of the consumer is important. Um, the consumer drives the market. We need to assess the baby boomers and the echo boom generation, which are their kids. That's the key. Understanding the perception and interests of the consumer market. Why Australia? Well, did you know that Australia is the sixth strongest international market inbound tourism into Canada? It is the second strongest market from the Asia Pacific, Asia Pacific region. A growth of 0.3% year over year for the past five years while the rest of the English speaking world is in decline. That's over $71 million increase in five years up to $393 million in 2012. 62% of the visitors from Australia are coming for leisure. 27% of Aussie visitors are 34 or younger. 37% are 55 or older. Therefore, the boom and the bust. How do we get there? Quantitative data used to val val validate the significance between variables 
A triangulation is the validity procedure where researchers search for convergence among multiple and different sources of information from Cresswell. I hope to triangulate both qualitative, or three, qualitative and quantitative data with observed information. Uh, statistics, an entry survey, an expert survey, and case study with image collection. What do I do now? Oh, there we go. Desired outcomes and applicability. Um, I hope the outcomes from my project will inform marketing. I offer recommendations for destination development, inform stakeholder investment opportunities, forecast growth patterns, support two of the Canadian federal government strategies, and will be transferable into other destinations and market sources. And this is my supervisor, Brian White, and Eugene Tomlinson, uh, member of my committee. And <laughs> Thank you for listening. Okay. Questions? Yes, Bill. Do you know what you'll be asking them yet? Yeah? Do, do I know what? Um, I have an idea. I haven't formulated exactly what I'll be asking them. Um, we are playing with the entrance survey of what they're expecting out of Canada. What do they expect to see? Will you be asking Australians who don't come to Canada? We're going to look at why both. They don't. Uh, no, we weren't planning well, on doing that. So I should ask them. Okay, good point. <coughs> yes, Marilyn. No question, just a comment. Great project, great presentation. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Yes. Yeah, could you could you just explain a little bit about some of the uh, inbound of the, the the actual business side of it, the inbound operators, and what you're going to be doing with them? Going to going the there. inbound Is operators. That Bill's question. Well, going to the inbound operators yeah. and working with them to see who's coming um, to Canada and who isn't, and who isn't, and working with them with the survey to survey their customers. Um, we're also looking at, in terms of the triangulation for greater validity, uh, Bernard. Uh, we're looking at what's called an inter-rater process, um, and that would be to get an industry partner also to code separate from my self-coding and compare uh, both coding processes so that it eliminates some of the bias. Yes? So are you focusing on the Echo generation? The uh, baby boomers and the Echo oh, generation, okay. yes. Um, we find that the Echo generation has a lot of influence on the baby boomers and vice versa. We listen to our kids, right? Okay, some of you are there. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify that while sounding blunt, yes. the point I was trying to convey is that when you choose something, you don't choose between that thing and not that thing, you choose between a range of options. And therefore, it's important to understand non choices. Is that the it, regression that I People are ran? assessing Canada <laughs> in relation to all the other options that they have. What um, analysis was that, Bernard, that I ran to eliminate the null hypotheses? <laughs> I think that's what I might be doing. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thanks, Donna. Uh, next presenter is Omar Salim, and the title of his presentation is Teacher Professional Development in Values Education, Understanding Curriculum and Practice. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, uh, good to see everyone. I'd like to begin with, since I am speaking about values, with the, with the value of grat uh, gratitude, and in particular to my colleagues at RRU who have really helped shape my level of thinking to where I am, uh, who are sitting in the audience, and then also the faculty, uh, you know, uh, Bill and Brian and Bernard, uh, Simon and Marilyn. Uh, I don't think I miss anybody, did I? Uh, uh, anyways, and, and, and also um, I'd like to really thank uh, my wife and children for putting up with uh, the, the balancing act we've all attempted to really, uh, you know, accomplish. So I just wanted to share that, um, and, and now I have like uh, four minutes left. So, uh, <laughs> anyways, I'm as a teacher, a college teacher, I'm really intrigued and fascinated by by quality teaching and learning, 
and, and, um, and also uh, uh, a more of a social cohesion within our community. So um, I think this cartoon represents uh, our education systems to some level, I think, uh, and the problems with it for that matter. And, and the reason I, I, I share this, I'll go into it a little bit further, but uh, before I do, I'll give you a little bit of an overview. So I'm gonna start broad and, and, and give you why I'm doing the research that I'm doing, the context and, and my research question, followed by uh, more sort of focusing and, and, and sharing with you my methodologies and methods. And then, and then finally, taking it broad again uh, and going with the outcomes and applicability. How, how is this relevant to society uh, as, as we're all involved in an applied uh, you know, doctoral program. I think that's the essence of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so here's a, an interesting um, uh, image, I think, that uh, uh, sort of puts things in perspective uh, in terms of why our education system is not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, where, it, you know, in terms, in terms of uh, where it is and, and improving. And, and you can see here, uh, um, over the last uh, uh, several years, enrollment, student enrollment is going up, you know, uh, really, really uh, high. And, and uh, but at the same time, you know, faculty, is staying static. The the um, faculty that we that we uh, uh, hire and, and and train for that matter, and 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 administrative costs are also going up. So we're what this is saying to me is we spend a lot of time and and money uh, it seems on on the financial side of things uh, as a business model, uh, both with administration and uh, and bringing in more students, but not so much on the academic and and uh, quality of teaching and learning. So why is that? Well, I think it's, it's partly, um, I don't think there's any nefarious person behind this. I think it's just a, a, a cultural phenomenon that's happening that we need to really question and challenge and improve. And, and that's tr changing trans and, and transforming education paradigms through a, a critical curriculum. So this is what I have as a, a particular prescription in terms of curriculum at, as it relates to teaching and learning. And, and so um, most of our institutions, both college universities and even to some level, are. Uh, uh, primary and secondary uh, schooling falls in this empirical analytical model, right, where we're, uh, where we're tested and evaluated based on pencil and paper testing. It's easy to do. It's, it meets the economic, you know, um, purpose to some level for efficiency and effectiveness. Um, and, and, um, and, the outcomes, and it's a very outcomes-based model, right, rather than a process-based model. Um, and so that's just one form of knowing, and this is a, uh, based on uh, Lovat and Smith's work, who are sort of uh, uh, sharing Herbermas, uh, the critical theorist Herbermas's perspective on, on ways of knowing. So that's the first cognitive interest according to Herbermas. The next one uh, is historic hermeneutic, and again, that's understanding, negotiating, uh, outcomes-based versus process-based, and, and, um, and that's sort of the communicative capacity end. And so we tend to do that, but not as much, but we still do that. In, and the last one is this critical reflexive, which, which is really critical uh, in terms of uh, uh, emancipating the student and knowledge and, and giving creativity, personal autonomy, and, and really uh, embracing those particular facets of knowing. And it's here where the values really uh, you know, stay uh, and, and come out, I should say. And so there's research that suggests that um, um, I'm going to pass this. I, I'm run out of time. I'm going to go straight to my question. And my question is, how do college teachers engage in values, education, professional development workshop, and how is this engagement made visible in their discourse, practice, and student responses? And I plan to do this through a design-based research and mixed methods model, where I'm, I'm uh, going to go into my institution, six to eight uh, teachers, faculty, uh, intervene with a values education program, and then, and then measure them through a qualitative mixed methods and quantitative approach uh, using design-based research methodology. And um, the societal relevance, I think we're connecting the dots. Uh, you know, in, so yes, beyond transformational and deep learning and authentic learning, what we're uh, getting at is um, uh, basically meeting the needs of employers who are saying we need people that are ability to work in teams and, and uh, verbally communicate effectively. These are all values laden, right? And, and, and also Workopolis and BMO recently did a study, again, personal positive attitude, communication skills, strong work ethic. These are all values laden. And, and again, uh, BMO, personality traits. And so what, in essence what we're doing is we're saying values and education are not separated. They come hand in hand, and we need to teach those um, in addition to teaching the technical and hermeneutic. We need to teach the self-critical, self-reflexive. I think I, I um, mistimed my, the amount of time I had, but uh, uh, that's it. That's, that's my presentation um, and my references, and I want to thank you for listening. Yes. 
question about you say the societal relevance, right? But then you show the survey of employers, what employers want. Mm -hmm. There's, there's to me, a, a disconnect between society, what society may need or what it wants, or what the larger values of society, and what simply employers want, which is hopefully sort of productive employees, right? But what, what relevance does that have to society? I think maybe you're, you're kind of mixing up those kind of two areas there. That's a little bit scary to me. I mean, I don't want to come into an organization and employers will say, these are the values, you have to adhere to that. It, you know, it's like creating sort of robots in some ways. You know? Yeah, I think that's, that's a great point. Um, and because I, I went through for time's sake, I didn't get a chance to really hit this point um, home. Um, values shouldn't be prescribed to people. They, they, should be, they should be negotiated locally. And the, in the current education context, we have a very centralized, in some cases, when we have centralized curriculum, where ideology is based on that analytical model, right? It, it, we, we're not allowed to have those other two particular knowledge domains addressed. And so as teachers and as institutions, we need to address those, those other, other knowledge domains. And so what I'm saying is the reason employers are, are saying, look, so in essence, I, I don't think they realize they still separate ed values and education, even employers. So the reason folks can't get along is because we don't necessarily, uh, it's not for the purpose of, of employers, but really that we need to, in order to build social cohesion and more effective, ethical, excellent uh, people in our communities, values are important and we can't neglect those. We, we need to address them and, and, and it has to be, a values education model doesn't prescribe from the top down. It, it, it negotiates contextually it, it uh, you know, decentralizes curriculum and so on and so forth. So I, I get, I, I share your, your point. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that we should do this so that employers have these people that are robots and they follow particular values. I, I, I'm, that's exact, uh, the opposite of what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, I'm just thinking it's employers that need to be educated on values, not the other way around. Yes, but the employers are made by, by the, the, the people that are, that are, that are uh, you know, us, that are graduate, you know. So we are those employers, you know. We, we tend to make it these systems and, you know, and it's, uh, no, it's, we're, we're at, the, at the core of things, it's individuals that make the systems and, and the cultures and so on and so forth. So, good point, yeah. You have any employers in mind, Ken? It was in the presentation, but I, I really, you know what I did? I'll be frank with you. I added that, that Herbomassian the chart, and that destroyed three minutes of my time. Um, but yeah, but, I, but I, needed to, I needed to add it, and I felt I did, and I, I, I put it in last minute, which you should never do. I tell my students all the time. So I've done exactly what I tell you know, students not to do, uh, and then it's now on, on live you know, and on YouTube. But, uh, but, 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 and, and, and I tell my students that uh, you know, sometimes we fail, and that's OK. You know, we learn from them, right? But, but that, that model you're talking about, there's many, many models that are, they come in many shapes and sizes. Values education works. And it works in different ways. But the key to values education, it needs to come from the bottom up, negotiated locally by the, the folks that are involved, not top down. And, and I think that's critical. It really is. And there's some models that are available. In fact, um, none, none, I haven't found any yet for the post-secondary environment. Uh, so I'm probably going to take models that are in the primary and secondary levels and, and look to modify those and create uh, part of my dissertation, create a values education um, workshop that's based on the critical curriculum. So we're not forcing anybody in a particular value. Yeah, thank you. Are you suggesting values can change come post-secondary? Are they a little more determined earlier on in life? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. A lot of folks believe that once you get to 18, 19, it's set. And in fact, research suggests both in psychology and sociology that you know, 18, 19, up to 30, even more, you know, the brain is still malleable and, and still uh, ready for enculturation of different values, right? And, and uh, so, no, I, I think that's a, there's a, there's a myth on that, but no, it's, we can, and in fact, uh, it's, it's possible. So, um, I think it should be at all levels. It shouldn't be just at one, you know, uh, it should be at all, all, all throughout life, I think. We should be questioning and being self-reflexive and, and attempting to be better human beings if we can. I, yes. I wondered, as honest curiosity, whether the outcomes of your research would change if you had, as a subject of analysis, students from different cultures. 
I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about a multicultural setting, but would it be different if, if you can apply the analysis in Canada and then compare it to a population in Brazil and then maybe a population in that's, that's a great point. In fact, um, I, like if you look at like uh, Finland, for example, they have a strong model of equity values, like nationally. So it's sort of enforced nationally. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. Equity and de decentralized curriculum, relational trust. You know, and this is why I think one of the reasons, you know, they don't, you know, shove homework and content down, you know, young people's. So, but they start that from there early on. So it's, you're right, it would be neat to compare Canada and our education system to something like Finland. And, and it's not to say Finland's the best model, but it's, it's, a, it's a model that's working, you know, and it's working for various reasons and it's something to look at. So great, great point. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Omar. Next presenter is Kent Williams. The title of his presentation is Theorizing Complexity Leadership Through the Lived Experience of the Way of Nature Retreat. Here, Omar, I'll give this to you. Us Mac users were so high maintenance. All right, we're just, just going to kick off with a, a short video and then I'm going to sprint through this. You know, Omar, you summarized it so nicely, so I just want to quote Omar on that thank you and save some time, so, so thank you. It's good to have everyone here today. Over the next five minutes, I want to sprint you through the, the why, the what, the how, and, and the hope of my important work. And at the end, I welcome uh, constructive feedback and, and questions that can help me to continue to explore my inquiry. The why, I'm often asked, you know, what, what, what is it that I'm studying? But I th I'd suggest it's more important to talk about the, the why, why I'm doing what I'm doing. And it's really grounded in my, my greater purpose of co-creating a better world and inspiring people to free agency, to enable them, as Immanuel Kant once said, Sapiro, dare to know, to have the power to experience, learn, and know. With my world-centric lens, I believe we shape the world and, and the world shapes us through our experience. And this is the subjectivity that I bring into the research. And it's what drives me to explore the way of nature experience, which I believe has the potential to break down walls of cultural embeddedness and open new capacity for transformational learning and adaptive change. We live in a rapidly changing world of complexity. And as the physical and social complexity of the world continues to evolve at a rapid pace, I would suggest that it's leaving us behind in many aspects through our, our pattern way of, of thinking. And this gap in complexity is creating challenges with no present solutions and requires a creative new approach in, to thinking and acting. And out of complexity leadership theory comes this law of requisite complexity. It simply states, it simply states that complex to, to complexity, you need complexity to defeat complexity. A system must possess complexity equal to that of the environment in order to function effectively. So in leadership terms, how do we develop this complexity needed to equal the complexity of our changing world? And this brings me to the, the what of my study, what I'm looking to explore. I want to study the effect of the way of nature program on individuals. The reflect, this reflective learning program invites participants to spend time in nature in a semi-structured process of collaborative dialogue, metadata practice, and extensive solo time in nature. 
The program enables reflective learning to develop self-awareness and a sense of meaning to the relationships and connections that interconnect the entire planet. I posit that this has the potential to develop our complexity of mind Way of, and Way of Nature, they've, they've developed these programs. They've spread all across the, the planet. And what I'm looking to do is parachute into at least two, two to three of these programs and uh, really find out the lived experiences of individuals in the program. And, uh, you know, I'm going to do this through exploring their, their stories and to see if there is transformational thinking and action that occurs during this reflective learning experience. This is my primary question. How does, the, how does participating in the Way of Nature program affect conscious awareness development of the individual? And the how, how am I going to get there? The theoretical framework that will guide my study is complexity leadership theory, and it is grounded really simply in freeing agency of individuals and collectives through a free-flowing dialectic process of innovation and evolution. Uh, my methodological framework is going to be phenomenological phenomenology centered. I want to explore the way participants experience the nature retreat and how does it affect them and you know really what is the lived experience. And the methods I'm looking at employing are video interviews, uh, reflective journaling, close observation, and a, t a, a competency measurement I'm also looking at. The who, I'm really looking at drawing on the participants that are enrolled in the Way of Nature programs and that they are stakeholders in organizations. And the other part of the who, and I want to take time to recognize, I, I see my supervisor there, Wendy Rowe, and her wonderful guidance, and also another part of my, another person on my committee who's a faculty here at Roll Roads is Marilyn ha Hamilton, and John P. Milton. I have a question mark there. He's deep embedded somewhere in Costa Rica in a nature retreat right now, and I've just reached out to him, but I'm hoping, hoping he's going to come on board as well. And really, the hope and you stole my slide first. It was, <laughs> so it shows how we group values and how we think together. Too much group think, I think. But really is to enable this knowledge uh, development, adaptability, and innovation to leadership learning approaches. And to do this through uh, publishing, conference exposure, and uh, potential documentary through the video uh, that I'm going to capture. And that's, that's it. So with that, I welcome some questions. Sorry, Bill, you can't go first. You always go first. No, go ahead. Um, well, it just sounds to me like you're going to interview advocates and participants who want to change, asking them whether what they're advocating and participating in leads to change. Isn't that a bit tautological? Well, really, Bill, what I'm really getting at is, is I want to find out there's lots of stuff in the literature, and you've seen it throughout time in the literature. You've heard Aristotle even talking about the value and benefits of, of nature. Uh, Einstein talked to it, and you know it's all throughout the literature. And I think even you probably have experienced time in nature where uh, there is this letting go and uh, creativity that comes out of it. Maybe you haven't, but I think a lot of us have experienced that. Um, that was not meant as an insult, but I'm just saying I don't know. I can't. I don't know what you experienced, but you may have. And I think that it's. It's, it's that, that's what I want to explore. I want to explore what's going on, and it's not a matter of, uh, yeah, I just want to find out what, what's, what's happening. I have my ideas that might be happening, but I want to explore with that, those participants that are coming into these programs. Uh, I'm, gonna... I'm intrigued by your competency measure. What is that a measure of, and how are you going to do that? Well, I delivered a 20-minute presentation to my cohort yesterday, and I had directly, implicitly put it as this leadership circle profile. It's one that I'm certified to do. Uh, there was a lot of feedback on that, so I need to think a little bit more on that. Basically, I was looking at uh, employing this uh, 360 uh, at baseline before the program started with the individuals, and there's three measures that I'm really interested in. I'm interested in uh, the leadership competency measure of um, relating, self-awareness, and systems awareness, because I think those are three important components that uh, you develop through this reflective learning that I'm really interested in. So I was inter I'm interested in perhaps capturing that, those uh, quantitative measures at, at the baseline, and then looking at six months out to see, once they're back in their organization, to see if there's any type of change. Sorry, I'm 
Here's my question. So it's leadership competency that you're yes. looking at, not competency in the natural world. That's right. As you can imagine, I would be interested. Yeah, it's just shit. I kept that kind of vague. I kept that kind of vague just because uh, I'm. I need to think a little bit more on that. Great, great study. Ken? Thank you, Ken. Yeah, I mean it's an interesting project, but I'm also thinking, you know, here you have a, a perfect experiment. Here's raw roads, right, surrounded by nature, fairly complex organization in many ways, and there's quite high levels of anxiety and stress in this institution, as in all universities to a large extent. Wouldn't that make a really interesting case? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Me and Wendy had dinner. You're sort of looking at people who are already in that frame of mind, and of course they're undergoing this for their own personal journey. But in terms of an organization, you know, where we're surrounded by this incredible nature and stress and environment and all of that, and and you find this degree of anxiety, which is out of sync with all the values that are supposed to be attached to this organization. And I'm just thinking you might want to look at that. That's an interesting perspective. Yeah, jokingly, I was going to say that uh, I had dinner with Wendy last night. And we were talking about how yeah, we need to put all roads through the, the Way of Nature program. But I'm just kidding when I say that. But um, I mean, it's a, it's a great point. Um, it's. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah um, there's a body of literature called the Experiential Education Association, which has been going on since the, the late 60s, which addresses many of the issues that you're, you're bringing forward in, se in the sense of leadership in the context of a natural ex uh, encounter. Mm -hmm. uh, Outward Bound was based on that. I mean, you know, I think you probably know that literature fairly well. Um, one of the things that I would bring forward is, is the idea that nature becomes a scenic backdrop to the development of well, one of the arguments against that has been that it's a scenic backdrop against which leadership can evolve and develop. It's not necessarily about learning about nature and natural processes. It, and the complexity theory that I think you're presenting here, the question I have, is there, what is that relationship? I, I, don't, I don't see it, it being made clear in terms of the relationship between the natural world and the encounters that occur which transform personality and the capacity of leadership versus that being a specific focus, the complexity theory of, you know, of, of leadership and understanding how that works. What is that relationship? Why does it have to be in nature? And, and why is it significant that it is in nature with this particular ta uh, case study that you're studying? Right, and uh, it's hard to present all my, inf all my data in five minutes. But you, break, you make some great points. I mean, just to uh, address the nature thing, I, the night, and it's, I'm just offering, I'm interested in this as one approach to reflective learning. It's that reflective learning that uh, Robert Keegan talks about in Harvard, uh, about developing, developing consciousness, to be able to really break away from our, um, the walls of the culture embeddedness. And nature just, I believe, allows that it is one setting and I believe there's many settings you know there's meditation and you could do in a city but I think it's it is a backdrop that allows for that solitude time for for reflection um, yes and as far as the complexity uh, the complexity leadership theory I, I just see that um, and if if I had more time I could take you through I'd be happy to go on the side and share you share what uh, how I see that fitting in to uh, to the the nature retreat, but I think I'm out of time. <laughs> what? Next presenter is Marilyn Pedmore, and the title of her